I get the opportunity to serve kids and serve people who center on kids. And as such, this idea of belonging has been something that it's not new, but has been emerging a lot within both the research and within um, things that are being done within education. So um, we've already had a time to kind of really think real deeply about what belonging is, what it feels like, but I wanna think about its impact as well. Um, I am really interested in, and I actually can't see at this point because of this, but uh, like what the different definitions are. I know that folks, I, I will kind of time out and just mention, I can't see the chat while I share this right now, but I'll come back to it where I can. Or um, Art, if you wanna unmute and tell, direct me to any important questions that you see that are coming up, I'm also happy to do that, but I'll do a little lecture mode and then I'll come on back. So um, a lot of folks, as we kind of go through and talk about what belonging means to you, say what's already been mentioned in the chat, feeling of kind of acceptance, um, being seen, being heard. Um, when I talk to kids, they put their hands on their chest or will do this. It's a very embodied kind of sense of self about like where this actually sits and how I feel. Um, but I think there's another couple of ways that we can kind of approach this. So there are two, there's actually a number of theorists who are, uh, and scientists who are talking about belonging. And I'm gonna pull from a definition from Walton and Cohen. There are two researchers at Stanford, and I'm gonna lean in part on Jeffrey Cohen's work. He's got a new book out. So if anyone's really interested in learning more, it's a book called Belonging, um, where he really talks about the research behind this concept. He, um, let me back into it this way and kind of tell a story. I was actually just working with a group of folks at um at Nickelodeon. Um, folks are familiar with Nickelodeon. It's a TV channel that produces content for kids. So we're actually talking a lot about belonging there and how their content can help support kids in feeling like they belong. One of the executives told the following story, which is that this morning is the first day of school for his daughter. And he got up early in the morning, hopefully to, to wake up before her, but she was already awake. And she was also already dressed. She was standing in front of the mirror with a look of fear and terror on her face. And he said that what he saw in that moment was that she was thinking as she goes to this new school, will I belong? Will I make friends? Will I connect? Will they see me? This palpable kind of sense there that she had this morning. And I think it's a great way for us to kind of pay attention and think about, um, you know, many of our kids are entering to school right now, starting new things, many of those that we care about. But if you can remember that kind of moment of stepping into a brand new space, you might have been asking yourselves these following questions. Do I belong here? Do I have anything in common with the people here? Can I be me here? And in fact, Cohen and Walton uh, talk about these as animating questions. We often talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. One of the base parts of these needs, in addition to water, shelter, is belonging, is connection. And so it's very simply this sense about, do I, can I belong here? Do I have anything in common? Can I be me? I've heard other people describe it as feeling accepted, or Brene Brown actually describes the opposite, that the opposite of belonging is the need to fit in, the need to make oneself altered or small to fit in. So here's another operationalized kind of definition from the University of California, San Francisco. They have had a lot of their work um, that has moved from issues of kind of justice and has translated into issues of belonging, but they've got this definition that I love that I'm just gonna read which is that belonging is an individual internal experience, a sense of oneself in relation to a community organization or institution. And an individual's sense of belonging is supported by the demonstration of inclusion from being acknowledged when passing in hallways to seeing one's image reflected in marketing and tangible opportunities for everyone to participate and contribute. I love this mouthful because it actually talks about what we can do to create places of belonging. That belonging is signaled and demonstrated in particular ways. When you're acknowledged in the hallways, when you see yourself around you. So I had this other wonderful opportunity to work with the hospital system. Perhaps folks are familiar with it in, in, um, 
in Oregon and Washington, the peace health system. And we did exactly this. What is, you know, what is belonging and what does it feel like? And one of the things, and what are the barriers to belonging? And one of the things that people have said is in the pandemic, everyone needing to be working in a hospital system covered in PPE, separated from each other, that people had fallen out of the habit of greeting each other, moving so fast, covered, and they had fallen out of that habit. And one of the things that they felt like was that they didn't know whether or not they belonged anymore. So one of the things they tried out was greeting each other again, saying hello, seeing each other, welcoming each other, that that was something that actually helped them to feel like they connect. So let's move to like, well, why belonging? Is it just a fun word that we say all the time or does it have any particular kind of meaning? So um, the research on this, and again, I'm gonna invoke that I'm a scientist and researcher um, and have been studying this for quite a long time. The research on the impact of belonging is quite impressive. There are lots and lots of studies that demonstrate that belonging is really impactful and meaningful. But besides the studies, we have our own wisdom too. We know what it feels like. But we know, and I'll talk about this specifically for kids, um, specifically for kids and for young folks, we know that when kids identify that they feel like they belong at school or have at least one grown up that feels like helps them feel like they belong, they have improved mental health. They have higher academic achievement. They have reductions in disciplinary problems. And then what we're actually finding within, as we look into the adults, that folks that indicate they feel like they belong have higher life and work satisfaction. Now let's go back to the kind of mental health piece. We understand, and actually Vivek Murphy, the Surgeon General has actually put out a new book and a new call to actually talk about isolation and that we're having unprecedented rates of isolation amongst our young people. And there's a lot of us who are children clinicians and a lot of the researchers that think that this sense of isolation is what's contributing to the dramatic increase in mental health issues that we have for children. And another way that we can kind of approach this is when kids say they feel like they have a space where they feel like they belong, the mental health problems are less. So this isolation that we think is due to multitudes of problems. I saw a question earlier about the role of social media, very complicated, uh, very present kind of space, but we do think the combination of multiple factors like um, the ways in which we parent, like the stressors that we've experienced, like social media, and like the pandemic have contributed to increasing isolation amongst our youth. So this is a an imperative that we try to find and create spaces for our youth and our children to feel like they belong because we know it's tapping them out in terms of their mental health. So I want to tell you another quick kind of story about how this really works and how, how belonging can, can work. So as I mentioned before, researchers at Stanford were really interested in seeing what they could do around belonging. So at Stanford, they were concerned by a persistent um, gap between African-American and white students' uh, academic achievement. So they went ahead and they did a belonging intervention at Stanford with a number of Black students. They did that intervention. At the end of the four years, um, they found that the students who received the intervention had higher GPA and were less likely to drop out. They then followed those same students seven years later and found that the students who received the belonging intervention also had higher job satisfaction and life satisfaction. So what was this amazing radical thing that they did? They, we'll take it back, they did a 45 minute intervention at orientation. That's it. And what they did is they had students read a letter that was ostensibly written by another older black student who said the following things. Transitions are hard. It's not about you and you'll make it through. That's it. That reading of that, in other words, that when you enter in a place and you're worried whether or not you belong, hey, transitions are hard. Hey, it's not about you. You're welcome and you belong here. That intervention, had seven year down the line impacts, 45 minutes. And I think that's super, something super important that when we welcome children in and we help them understand that challenges to belonging are normal, they don't last forever. And it's not about you. 
that gives them a means of seeing and understanding the world around them that's, that doesn't convey that there's something wrong with them. So the analogy that Cohen uses is that it's as if people are equipped with an umbrella to deal with the daily onslaughts of microaggressions or not belonging, that they're actually protected from that. I wanna expand the idea of wouldn't it be amazing if, if this is the consequence of actually giving kids 45 minutes of time and attention, imagine what it would be like if the actual system really made them feel welcome. <laughs> imagine if rather than equipping individuals with, in, with umbrellas, we had entire systems that allowed them to feel seen, heard, and valued. So the research impact is consistent and is impressive and really, really shows up that small communications and tweaks around how kids are seen and entered into spaces really are impactful. Now, if it was that easy, we'd be doing it all the time. There are a number of barriers to belonging. Um, those barriers include our automatic assumptions about each other, include um, sometimes our misperceptions and biases of each other, includes our system of education that makes it really difficult to see and know kids all the time. There are lots of barriers, but there's also lots of strategies to overcome them. And what I've had the great pleasure and honor of doing is working with, at this point, approximately 600 teachers to ask them, what do they do? How do they actually help kids feel like they belong? And they come up with amazing strategies. You probably see these strategies pretty much every fall. There's a viral video of teachers greeting kids with all these elaborate handshakes or high fives as they come into the classroom. It actually turns out that's an evidence-based way of supporting belonging, that each kid has their own greeting. I see you, you're welcome here. Something as simple as saying a kid's name right being able to say the whole entire name. Now, again, I invoke that I'm from Hawaii. In Hawaii, we have very long, beautiful, complicated names, right? So my Hawaiian name is Pua Ali'i Okalani. It's a mouthful. And what would it mean if actually someone could say all of that and not just say, oh, I'll just call you Allison instead? So that being seen and heard, so wonderful innovation, work with a school that came up with a... Um, uh, um, what do you call it, a role that included a little um, button that you could push where you could hear the kids say their name so that you could actually hear and practice, right? Those are innovations that you can do. Maybe you've seen it on some people's emails. If you want to hear how to pronounce my name, you can do this. It's a little add-on, but that's a, a very simple start. So I think sometimes we think about, you know, how could we create systems of belonging? How big and complicated must they be? we could actually start off with greeting. And in fact, we have evidence to support and there's a randomized clinical trial called Greet, Stop and Prompt. And what they taught teachers how to do is how to greet folks, how to say hello and welcome in, stop, which by the way, was a mindfulness-based intervention to allow and support teachers in having and catching a moment and prompt with soliciting positive behavior. That that with little kids ended up helping a lot in terms of reducing problematic behavior, and increasing academic achievement. So many of these types of interventions can be short, they're very powerful. They have to be authentic though. So what has probably ended up happening, and I'll tell you this kind of story, I mentioned that I was new to the Pacific Northwest and I was coming up here and um, there was an indoor mall, there weren't a whole lot of indoor malls <laughs> where I was at before. So I'm walking through the indoor mall and all of a sudden I see all these signs, beautiful paintings yelling, you belong, you belong. And I'm like, I don't know that I need to belong to Abercrombie and Fitch. Like, I don't know that I need to belong to all. So there's almost become like a swagification, a commodification of yelling, you belong at people. Any of those of you that are helping kids transition into college, I'm sure they're overwhelmed with you belong, you belong. And actually Jeffrey Cohen has a piece called Stop Yelling, You Belong at Everybody. It takes more than just the signaling. It has to be partnered with authenticity. It has to be partnered with, I want to know you or see you. Now, the jacket is nice or the you belong painting is beautiful, but it also has to translate much as you all thought into you know, actual connection in some way, shape or form. The last kind of piece I wanna highlight is that um, storytelling is really important. 
and mentorship. When kids get a chance to see other folks that have been and walked through their shoes ahead of them, it really helps them see that there's a possibility that they could belong, that they could be um, part of what goes on there. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pause. I know we've got 30 minutes, but I haven't been able to take a look at the chat and that's making me a little bit paranoid. And I want to actually just pause to see questions, ideas, um, et cetera. So I think I stopped the share and I'll just turn to chat and see if there are ways I can be responsive to any of the questions because I've been talking for way too long. So if I can pull up the chat again. Okay. So um, are there questions that people want to kind of begin with? Um, we gives us a big long time for questions. I have more research I can kind of talk about and I see questions here, but let me see if anyone wants to raise their hand and kind of offer insights or questions first. And then I can take a look at the 18 messages that have popped up on my screen. So Art, I'm going to let you uh, tell me if anyone raises their hand, but I'm going to go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm watching for that. I don't see anybody just yet. Okay. So. I can make the, I, I'll just go through, I can make the slides available. Oh, Gary, Gary, was your hand up? And we have Tony in Montreal. Okay, uh, we'll do Gary, Tony, and then Montreal. Gary. I'm unmuting, I just unmuted myself. Hi. Okay. So the thing that came to my mind was uh, the wonderful power of music and uh, how you can feel like you belong to a performer. And uh, that magical thing that happens when the performer comes on stage and then you are together, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, it's the thing that really I just thought, wow, that is so amazing that that can happen. And then I like to do that in a small group, but also that that could happen at a very large mm -hmm. group that you could feel like you belong with this person. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, just think about like, I, I, I love thinking about that. I, I think it's an embodied sense, right? As even you were talking, I started moving along, right? It's an embodied sense of kind of listening to music. But have you ever been in a group of folks and swayed with the music together? Or have you ever been with a group of folks and sang together? Oh, yes. Right. And we have tons of research evidence to find that people who sing together lower their cortisol, lower their all, breathe together all of these kinds of pieces as being one way of kind of getting a sense of belonging kind of connection. Um, Gary, I love the invocation of, of music. And I think it's a great way for us to think about what could be done. Um, I also think about the cultural traditions around sitting in circle with the drum beat, pulling us to kind of together to actually synchronize in particular kind of ways. Awesome. I just, one more thing to share is yeah. uh, in a spiritual group, that was men singing together. And there was something just remarkably powerful about that experience. And I really value that time that I did that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Tony. Hi. Um, my daughter's 25. So I've been out of touch with the school system, the primary school, elementary school for 10 to 15 years now. And I'm just wondering looking for encouragement in terms of how teachers uh, are are working with the kids in this in this stressful environment that they're in pandemic and post pandemic like has the education system and teachers um, adapted and brought in you mentioned new strategies but overall is it improving Oh, what a question. Um, so that's a complex and beautiful question. And I first would defer to anyone here in the space who's a teacher to kind of speak to what it's like um, and, uh, and you know, encourage folks to kind of, you know, go ahead and kind of connect there. So I defer to folks that are classroom teachers. And um, the challenges of teaching have been incredibly complicated and very, very difficult. And I um, spend a lot of my job trying to support teachers um, for their really, really hard work. So um, I'm also, some might call me um, pathologically optimistic. So um, I'm pathologically optimistic about the innovations and the creativity and what I get a chance to see and the big hearted nature of folks that are doing work within schools. So um, I can say that I've been on a journey of supporting teachers most recently and in doing so, 
I've seen a lot of folks really resonate with creating belonging. It just seems to be something that kind of feels like and kind of makes sense. There have been a number of challenges, of course, um, you know, the toxic polarization that's happening in our educational field, how difficult it is, um, the ways in which words become weaponized, identity, like it's complicated. But the idea of figuring out how to say hello to a kid and welcome them into the classroom is something that kids are really good at I mean, and that teachers are really good at. The ideas of actually kind of coming together, and I saw this as a kind of a question, but things that can be done together. How do we organize our space such that people feel like they're welcome? That's accessibility. That's things like, you know, what are we reading? What are we seeing? Who's there? Um, there's some great things that you can do in terms of how do I give feedback in a way that conveys the sense that I see you and I understand your needs. Um, so I think we're amassing incredible tools that can be used to support um, creating cultures of belonging that I'm really hopeful for. And I think the demands um, of teachers and the challenges for our youth are incredibly daunting. And it's why we need everybody meditating on it, sending positive thoughts on it, figuring out what we can do about it. So there's, thank yeah, thank you. Thank you. There was, I think another hand, but then I also see Matt. But our, I don't know if there was someone after Tony. I see Matt is the only one right now with hand raised. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. Do I have to help you do the thing? Um, I'll, go ahead. I'll ask him to unmute. Okay. There we go. Matt, you can unmute okay. yourself now. Yeah. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. This is wonderful. Um, my question was. Um, you know, how is, how is belonging, uh, what, what is the research, what does your research say and what does the science say with, um, you know, children with like, uh, who are on the spectrum? Yep. Um, are they the same strategies? Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing about belonging is that everybody needs it in some way, shape or form. I think we wanna get kind of complicated with like, do you need to feel like you belong everywhere all the time with everybody? No, that takes away my agency and choice that there are some places I don't wanna to belong to. When we think about kids in terms of accessibility or kids that are struggling in different ways, um, we know clinically that's really important that they find places, all kids find places to kind of connect. Um, so the research in terms of specifically on kids on the spectrum, uh, I think the research that I can kind of pull towards is that uh, interventions in classrooms that help bring those kids in and help them feel like they really belong are really helpful. So I'll speak about one intervention in particular. It's an oldie, but a goodie called the Jigsaw Glass Classroom. So the Jigsaw Classroom was a um, mechanism of teaching that was about highlighting everybody's different needs and bringing them together. So Think about it this way. You've probably all kind of experienced this at work or some other space where you have a group project and um, you actually need people with different skills to help complete the project. It means that everybody is given like a different task or a different um, area of strength and they come together to collaborate. And that kind of is done within classrooms to kind of give, okay, you're the writer or you're the person that has this skill to bring folks together. Jigsaw Classroom has been used and is out actually so kind of popularized. I think we kind of forget it as an actual specific intervention, but that was done to bring kids with disabilities into the classroom. Then it was done to bring kids who are experiencing marginalization into the classroom. So it's a very successful kind of technique that has fostered belonging. I would point you to, if you're really interested in learning more about specific kind of techniques and resources in the classroom, Jeffrey Cohen's book on belonging is fabulous for that. And I can leave it as a link. But Matt, let me come back to you. Did that address your question? I got kind of excited. Yeah. Okay. Allison, we have uh, Armin and uh, Meredith with their hands raised. Okay, perfect. Um, Meredith? Hi. Hi. This is a wonderful conversation. I love it. Yeah, Hi. fabulous. Um, this may be obvious, but and um, 
working with uh, trauma and integrating the same sense of belonging where there hasn't been, it seems like, you know, you could just take it from what you've shown us already or talked about, you know, and shall we say, bring it home or bring, yeah. It's just mm -hmm. wonderful. I also, um, so well, thank you. And um, I worked with kids for 30 years and it's just so um, tremendously heartwarming, tremendously just to hear about the incredibly intelligent, uh, loving work that you're doing. And so thank you so much and mm. everyone who works with you. I wish I could have, but <laughs> I, I was a good teacher. I was a good preschool teacher and um, counselor. So I like that, but it wasn't among the teachers. There wasn't this wonderful, you know, it was very spotty. Mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. You know, do are we militaristic or not? <laughs> and I wasn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm just so happy to hear from you and about you and thank you so much. Oh, I really, really appreciate it. Thank that. Thank you so much. It means a lot coming from someone that works with with kids. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Let's see if Armin. Can we go back to Armin and give yeah, him let's try. Time? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Oh, okay, great. So uh, I put my question there too. As I was reflecting my childhood, I guess to me that sense of belonging or lack of it. I think it was one of your slides too. It's when transitions, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an environment that you're used to, there's no need. It just naturally, you feel belonged. I think sometimes some people do. I think transitions are heightened periods of that. But um, I mean, I think, and I think we saw it somewhere in the chat too. I think there are some folks and I know and I witness, I support some folks who never feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a hard place to, to be. And I, I think often in the context of trauma, folks feel like they've been broken or damaged. Could, could, could it be like uh, for a while you belong and then suddenly something happens, you unbelong? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. There's a great organization called the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley, which is another resource that I'll share that talks about belonging, bridging, and also breaking uh, about when we kick people out of groups, when we decide that we don't want to be part of a group. There's all different types of kind of breaking. And someone kind of asked, like, this is much of my work that I do on kind of polarization is that when we've decided that our circle of human concern we've drawn it smaller and smaller, that there are more others than there are, you know, part of the group. So I think you're, you're raising some really interesting, you know, places for us to kind of think about. Um, and just to kind of notice, do I feel like I belong all the time? Great. And there's some folks that don't. And also, how do I extend that belonging? I also think about it as part of my own faith tradition in many is hosp hospitality. How do we warm? How do we welcome? How do we bring folks in? Um, so that's another place that I think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda. Hi. Hi. So, it's so nice to see you and meet you. Yeah, uh, this, I'll try to be quick with this. Uh, my husband and I uh, just came back. Uh, he's German and we spend a lot of time in Berlin every year. Uh, we have, uh, we are uh, performance artists uh, with dance and movement and theater, and uh, some of our subject matter is uh, race, uh, uh, um, patriarchy, memory, because he's German, guilt, uh, and uh, patriotism. In any case, uh, all of those things come into play as uh, we found out about uh, certain schools. They were um, 
uh, what do you call it, middle to high schools in uh, Berlin that like everywhere in, in Berlin and in other cities in Germany, they're constantly dealing with issues around the Holocaust, constantly kind of figuring out theatrical ways to uh, process some of that material with the kids. And uh, so I volunteered uh, Helmut and me uh, because of some of our work that centered on it. And we had never taught middle to high school students. We've done our work in Canada and, and Germany and the USA across uh, college campuses. Well, it was really interesting, uh, not only because I had uh, um, uh, contacted the schools because I thought if they're dealing with the Holocaust, they should be dealing with all of the other kind of racism that's coming up. I'm sorry, I'm not. Okay, I got to get to it. So in any case, uh, the schools that we went to, not only did they have anti-discrimination committees, they also had a social worker assigned to work with certain schools. And I'm just wondering, Dr. Allison, uh, of the uh, schools that you visited in the USA, and I have no sense of how things work here. Do Are there other support systems that are privy to working with uh, uh, not just the counseling, but uh, the social system, social worker and yeah. Yes. So it really depends on where, um, and there's multiple kinds of models for this. And I'm sure folks here can actually speak about it. But so for example, I used to run the, um, the clinics, the hospital clinics in high schools. So there were hospital clinics, we had health providers, we had counselors, we had social workers. So that was one model of actually bringing all the resources in. There are mm -hmm. a lots of different models that have actually moved towards issues of either racial justice or discrimination or diversity, equity, inclusion. But now you're seeing a lot of folks are diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Huh. And a lot of folks are dropping the DEI and moving to the B. And just so there's this kind of emerging kind of space for people to attend to the social space here. That's not something totally new. Um, you know, the idea of kind of providing multiple types of supports for kids. And I think that's the thing I love about belonging. It ain't new. Um, it's not new. <laughs> you know, we're so, you know, I'm going to call it this and show this, but this is what we know. I want to reiterate that what we know, what many people know is how to love children. I think mm -hmm. teachers know how to love children. And I think I want to spend time reminding us about the ways in which we love and provide support for children. And we need to have more opportunity for that and more opportunity to raise that up and pay attention to it. Um, that's, that's the point. Yeah. 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 So there are not ways for that. Yeah. The example you gave of the 45 minutes, you know, more, yeah. more, more. Imagine if that was 45 minutes, kept those kids in school and heightened their GPA. What if they were actually treated well? Because I'll, I'll, I'll mention that that study in particular actually controlled for whether or not they had reduced experience of racism on campus and they didn't. Wow. So it wasn't as if the rest of the school treated them better. So imagine that. Yeah, you can exactly. give them just a little bit of an umbrella, but what if we had entire systems filled with belonging that saw people yeah. as valued yeah. and cherished members of their spaces? And I do think that's the commonality as we think to things like Holocaust, genocide, treating it, dehumanization and not seeing people as people is one of the multiple kind of causes that complicated for sure. And I'm not saying that belonging would have solved everything, but I'm gonna stay in my lane and just kind of hype up <laughs> belonging for a little bit. I see that, thank you so much, Brenda. Lisa, I see that you have your hand raised as well. I know we're gonna get there. I think it could, there you go, go ahead. Lisa. I just got the cue. I hope this isn't too off topic. I missed the beginning and I noticed you're talking about education a lot. I'm thinking about, I guess at a more micro level, family. <laughs> yes. Belonging, I went to a wedding in our family a week and a half ago, <clears throat> about 80 people. And, you know, a lot of extended family, we all hadn't seen each other in years, and everybody's pretty different, lives all over the country, you know, Americana today. And I really was questioning with a number of people, like, how much do I belong here? How much do they belong here? I mean, we were all happy for the bride and so on. But it's this very odd feeling of, 
you you have this common history and so on, but do you really belong? Yeah. So I don't know if you can address that at all. I mean, I don't have anything else to kind of add to that except what a very human experience, right? And that many folks are asking themselves, where do I belong? And perhaps the hope is that, that we find that belonging in our family, but we know many folks find that belonging in our um, chosen family and the family that we can kind of construct. Um, so, you know, what does it mean to belong is also this piece around um, feeling seen and accepted in all ways. Um, and sometimes that happens within a family and sometimes it doesn't. So um, I think you're speaking to, and I think, you know, a family reunion is another place where that, that kind of comes together um, in, in the kind of complexity. I also mentioned in FLAG, I spent a lot of time um, working and researching and have written a book on multiraciality and listening to multiracial kids talk about their sense and understanding of belonging. So that's also what gets me on this kind of journey is the ways in which, you know, some kids walk into their family and they don't look like anybody there. What does that mean? Um, or they are too much of this or too little of that. What does that mean? And I listen to mixed kids talk about those experiences and also the agency that they have to um, create spaces for belonging. I also want to like be clear, like kids aren't the victims in this story. Kids are writing and creating spaces for belonging. And, um, and I think we have to just be smart enough to kind of keep up um, as well. Well, Thank you. When you're saying that, I'm just yeah. to add, it's to belong to something. I'm almost thinking you need to have some kind of regular contact. You know, family reunions. You might not have seen each other in 15 years, so your impressions are very old, and so on. So, no matter what the group is, if if it's not fairly current and regular, it's hard to belong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks for raising the issue of family, um, Kathleen. Okay, here's a really different question. Okay. Can there can there be too much belonging? Yes. And I, yeah, because I'm thinking about really tight-knit groups who identify where it's a closed system, could be a racist group, could be a fascist yeah. group, could be whatever group. So yes. what about groups where there's too much of a good thing, maybe? So yes. speak to that. <laughs> yes, I think it's a beautiful way for us to get nuanced about the conversation. And you've actually just talked about it. When, and what happens is that we close our circles of belonging tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. That's the place of concern. Someone, and I see it here, it's toxic nationalism. It is any group that gets to that kind of space. We And let's also think that those spaces, like, um, you know, uh, spaces of group that are often kind of compelled into places of violence and violence against others are really good at making people feel like they belong. Right. So the tools and techniques of belonging are, are weaponized, right? So why did you feel compelled to join this space? Well, because they made me feel like I belonged, right? Um, and okay, what did you have to do? Well, I have to do this to feel like I belong. How much did you have to do? I have to keep on doing more. Also, in order for me to belong, if my belonging is predicated on other people not, mm. that's the problem, right? In order for me to belong to this secret club, then you can't this sanctified space then you can't this qualification of what humanity is that's where belonging goes too far so kathleen i so appreciate the conversation because i think sometimes we get on the you know the belonging on the wall at the mall and <laughs> and not think enough about the kind of complexity so yes but we also have to be aware and someone has asked like my Yes, I see here the hazing in terms of fraternities and sororities are all of those kinds of pieces. Um, not to say fraternities and sororities in and of themselves are bad spaces for belonging, but in the extreme, when it's gone to that, it's a, it's a place, it's a problem. But one of the things too, is that we have to be really aware, or I spend a lot of my time as someone that's trying to address toxic polarization by understanding the mechanisms of belonging and how they are weaponized. So when we think about the radicalization of groups, it's often because people feel like they don't belong, right? And how to capitalize and move that. So we've got to be, you know, sophisticated about this. Um, you know, we uh, we have to think about how we can actually create systems of belonging, not just with like a Pollyanna is great for the belong, but also to think about two things that you can go too far. Second, I don't want to belong everywhere. What about my own agency? 
right? And think about this with kids and kids in schools. What I'm asking for is one, one adult that someone can feel like they can connect with, so one grown person on campus. We have consistent research that marginalized groups, when we ask kids whether or not there's any adult on campus with whom they trust or interact or feel like they belong, they say no. Not even one. So it's a great kind of caveat. We got a teeter totter, <laughs> find a sweet kind of spot there as well. Um, I see that there's a ton of stuff kind of coming up in the chat that Thank I just want to real quick. Thank you so much. So I will make um, my slides available within the slides are the citations that are available. Um, I can also make sure that people get the name of the book. Um, both my own book and the book on um, belonging as well. So, um, and then I also do believe that there are some um, means of capturing the chat, but I see Lynn and then um, Marsha, but Lynn, let's go ahead with Lynn. Did it work? Yes, hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm in Calgary. Hi. <laughs> I love this today. I, I fell asleep and I thought, oh, Rick's. And so when I turned it on, you said in the meditation, you said, imagine or remember the warmth of feeling heard, seen, and accepted. And I had an experience today, like I had a counseling session, I had a lot of counseling over the years. Uh, this is a new counselor. And so when I left the session today, I, I just felt so smart ass and full of myself in the best way you know I just felt so good about me and I and I thought what was it and we talked about some of my esoteric interests which I won't go into but she understood that and so I was thinking about the irony of especially in children we're trying to instill that sense of there's no one like you mm -hmm. you are unique and the more we are in touch with that the less we are accepted Mm. Mm. the more we express who we are at least that's what I found and I don't mean that as a you know poor me I just mean we're all so careful you know not to upset somebody else and yet here we are with these little souls wanting them to know how incredibly special they are and then once they start expressing that they don't belong mm. mm-hmm I mean, I think it's, I love what you're kind of raising up. And I think one of the tasks that I have as a, as a parent or as a teacher is to recognize that difference and that specialness and make them feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. Someone asked like, where do you, what do you tell a person who says, I've never felt like you belong? Then it means that it's on me. Like you belong here in my heart and I must do a better job of helping you to know that. That's what I'd like to kind of be able to say. And that's in your specialness and in your difference and in the ways that we're different. You know, my work is really about how do we connect across our differences? Mm -hmm. That it's actually our differences that make us better together. You know, that we talk about long bridges, but I, there's so much that you're raising up that I think is resonant, right? With this idea about like, I love that you came out feeling special and feeling good about you. Good. You know, we need to have time and spaces for that. For that. Um, and the thing I was going to say, maybe you've heard this story before, uh, Jack Cornfield and, and Tara Brack, uh, it's part of their power of awareness. The high school math teacher who has the students write one quality about every other student in the class mm -hmm. and make the list. Mm -hmm. And then she assembles a list for each person and they get to take it home. So there's one quality for each person. And then she goes to the funeral, like 10 years later, some guy who was killed in Vietnam, when they find his body, Guess mm. what was in the pocket? Oh, the yeah. list. Mm -hmm. And it was those wonderful qualities that made that person belong. Mm -hmm. I just, oh, that just is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. We don't tell each other. Mm -hmm. You were wonderful today. I loved it. Oh. And that's sincere. Oh, no, no. This is lovely. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. What a beautiful space. So I, I think. I'm already at your time. I want to be respectful of that. I don't know, Art. You tell me what to do, um, but yeah, we're uh, in time. Yeah, it's it's up to you. Uh, but we usually end around seven thirty, and it's seven thirty one now. Okay. Can we can we see Marsha, and then sure. um, I could try to take a look at the chat as I kind of yeah, Marsha. So, uh, one more question for Marsha, then yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, was wondering if you could address the issue of 
being strong enough within yourself to walk away uh, and say, I don't belong here. Yes. Yes. That's a really important life skill. Yes. Yes. Uh, That's so beautiful and hard to do when we are so organized around trying to feel like we belong to feel like, oh, it doesn't feel so good. Or I don't like what they're doing. I mean, we talk about with kids with peer pressure, what would it mean for you to be able to say, no, I don't want to do that when everybody else is doing it. Let's also hold like adolescence in their brain and their development. It's really, really hard for them to do. And that is not some sort of character failure. That is a place in development. Right. Um, so I think sometimes we punish kids for like, why did you go with the group? Well, cause this is what I'm learning. But I think Marcia, the way that you're talking about it is like, that is a skill to know. And I think also one of the bigger skills that comes to is how do I belong to myself? Exactly. How do I actually know what I have integrity to do and say, how do I belong to myself? Cause I'll tell you in short, the majority of the work that I do is about people that don't feel like they belong to themselves. Yeah. Right. They've been taken from it, damaged, all, all that kind of stuff. So thank you so much. I know that I'm at your time. I'm so sorry I didn't get to get to all of the wonderful chat. I'm going to try to maybe connect up with Rick and folks and make resources um, available. Thank you so much for making me feel like I belong in this space because I was like, oh, Lord, 30 minutes of a meditation. I don't know nothing. But you all made me feel um, really welcome. So thank you all for your wonderful love and um, practice. And I really appreciate your time and the space. And um you filled up my heart. So thank you so much. I'll go ahead and take a look at the chat if I can, but thank you.